So Mark Hyman is a world-renowned medical doctor who is leading a health revolution, one focused on using food as medicine to support longevity, energy, mental clarity, happiness, and so much more. His latest book, if you don't have it, please go get it, is Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. And it's available now on Amazon. And I think for a while it was the number one uh, book nonfiction book uh in the world wasn't it for a little uh, bit? no actually it was fiction and nonfiction even though it's fiction not fiction of all categories so, yeah so all the stuff that was on the fringe for so many years because we met like 30 years ago or something yeah, and yeah, like yeah. functional medical yeah. doctor was like oh that's kind of that weird guy in the corner yeah yeah the weird guy i'm uh, still the weird guy in the corner but <laughs> you're no longer the weird guy in the corner actually it was actually an ariana huffington threw some party in new york it's like launching Huffington Post or something. And I remember yeah. uh, she had connected us. Um, so maybe it's a good place to start. It's just why you've written so many books. Uh, you have a lot out there. Could you tell us the inspiration for your latest book and like why that seemed important to get out into the world? Thanks for the uh, question and for having me. And uh, it's great to be able to chat with you all today. I, I think the reason I wrote Young Forever was because the science of longevity has radically transformed in the last decade or so. And a lot of the conversations around longevity have become uh, really uh, deep in science and they also miss something really big. And so a lot of scientists are talking about what we call the hallmarks of aging, these fundamental things that go wrong that if we fix would extend our life by 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> As if we treated heart disease and cancer, we might extend it by five to seven years if we got rid of those from the planet. But no one was really asking the question of, well, what's if the hallmarks are causing all chronic diseases and disease of aging, what's causing the hallmarks? And this is where functional medicine comes in. And really why I've written all my books is really to bring the science of functional medicine to a broader audience and to help them understand that the body is an interconnected ecosystem, that we have to deal with root causes, and that we have to learn how to create balance in the system and not treat individual reductionist parts and pieces. And so the, the impetus for the book was to give people a roadmap. And a lot of longevity books out there are great, but they're high level, they're academic, or they're kind of sciencey, but not with a roadmap of what the heck do I do with this information? How do I apply it to myself right now? What do I need to know? What do I need to eat? How do I need to exercise? How do I need to manage stress? What are the latest um studies showing on the role of various kinds of supplements or herbs. What about other practices that are science-based? How do we incorporate those into our life? And so I wanted to give people both an understanding of the science of the why, as, as well as the what and the how of what to do. And that's really why I wrote the book. Beautiful. And um, and you're right, the whole longevity space has just kind of boomed recently, and it's actually really amazing to see. Um, so there's some people, and in our series, we'll be talking to other people, but there's some people who say, you know, if you do one thing, just intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, that's the thing to do. Other people like, just exercise, don't worry about anything, just, just, just exercise. Other people like, find good friends, just to find friends. So could you tell us where you're, well, what's the central door that if you're like, all right, here's the first practice that in, yeah. your, studying in your work, that's like the heart of kind of where, where to go. And again, we're not just looking at longevity in terms of length of years. We're looking at quality of years as well. Yeah. Well, that's like asking me, how do I grow healthy tomatoes? I'm like, well, what's the one thing you need to do? Well, just sunlight, but no soil or water. Or just water, but no sunlight or soil. I mean, you know, it doesn't quite work like that. I hate to break the news to you, but there are a number of foundational things that are really important. And I'll just kind of give you the highlights. One, eliminate ultra-processed food, period. Two, dramatically reduce or eliminate refined starches and sugars. Occasionally it's fine, but they're recreational drugs. They're not substances to be used on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Three, as you age, you need more protein. And we can get into the depths of that conversation about whether we should be vegan or paleo, what kind of protein, how much protein it matters. And protein is key to building muscle and muscle is the currency of longevity. And if you lose muscle, you age faster, you become less functional and more frail and decrepit and your whole metabolic health goes down the hill. And third, resistance training all exercise is important but resistance training whether it's bands or body weight or weights whatever turns you on you have to build muscle and and those are the fundamental principles and then i would sort of add you know a few other key things i think building connection community belonging is essential 
and then everything else, you know, sleep uh, is key, obviously, but everything else sure. is is down the hill from that. You know, the right supplements, fun mm -hmm. practices, hormesis, plasmapheresis, exosomes, all the kind of fancy stuff. That's all down the road. But you can achieve almost, I think, a guarantee of living to 100 years old if you actually follow the fundamental principles and you actually apply them to yourself in a rigorous way. Awesome. There's so many things we can talk about. And uh, um, it's a little bit like, where do you begin when, when there's so much in this world that uh, is important from, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about sugar. I think it's in chapter four that you really go into why sugar needs to be uh, addressed and eliminated. And I'm curious, can you kind of tell us what your latest discovery is in, should we avoid all sugar and where, yeah, where do yeah. you what is the right relationship with that? But I, my intuition says that, that you're, I don't have, know the science behind it all, but my intuition says that you're onto that. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and yeah. Also on inflammation, if they're, if the two can be answered in the same. They're totally connected. I mean, listen, I, I've written 18 books on this topic. So <laughs> something I've been talking about and writing about for a long time. If you know, we look at, if you look at the single biggest driver of age-related diseases, it's something called insulin resistance. Uh, which really drives poor metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And that means that you are somewhere on the spectrum of uh, poor blood sugar management with higher levels of blood insulin and progressing towards prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. But you don't have to get type 2 diabetes to suffer all the consequences. Mm -hmm. So there are four key nutrient sensing pathways that are critical to longevity to understand them properly regulate them. How do you turn the switches or the dials on these pathways to optimize your function and extend your life? And more, not only really extend your life, because it's really about the quality of your life, improve yeah. your quality of life, your vitality, and what we call your health span, which is how many years you're healthy. Most people spent the last 20 years of their life in poor health. So your health span is 80% of your life and your lifespan is 100%. And you yeah. spend the last 20% in poor health. The thing that's driving it is insulin resistance. And so one of the four pathways is directly influenced. Actually, all of them are, by the way, but, but one of them is called insulin signaling pathway. And this insulin signaling pathway is stimulated by excess starch and sugar. And that drives a cascade of, of phenomena in your body, including deposition of, of visceral fat, fat around your belly, which produces something called adipocytokines, or basically inflammatory molecules that come from your fat cells that spew out a fire throughout your body. So it's literally fire in the belly. And that causes dementia, cancer, heart disease, and increasing insulin resistance and creating a, a vicious cycle. It also has effects on hormones and muscle and brain. And I mean, it's, it's really the big driver of, of, of all age-related diseases. The other pathways also respond like mTOR, which mm -hmm. is more involved with you know protein regulation, protein synthesis, but also can be overstimulated by sugar, as well as you know too much sugar affects the impact of sirtuins and AMPK, which are also two of the other key longevity switches and we call our nutrient sensing pathways. These are this is the one hallmark of aging that I think is the most important and affects all the others. They're not all created equally, right? So we call about, for example, damaged proteins. Well, how do proteins get damaged from too much sugar? Right. So I think, I think we got to go, got to go back upstream to the root causes. So I think, I think if you're really looking at the impact of, of starch and sugar, it's, it's become, you know, something we consume in pharmacologic doses, 152 pounds per person per year of sugar, 133 pounds of flour, which by the way, is pretty much below your neck. Your body can't tell the difference. In fact, flour is almost all glucose, which is far more insulin stimulating than actually sugar, which is half fructose and half glucose, believe it or not. So I think below the neck, your body can't tell the difference between a bagel and a soda. Now, it, it, you know, this to say, not to say that you can never eat that, but the key is how do you create a resilient metabolic state? How do you, how do you form a state of metabolic resiliency where you have more degrees of freedom? For example, if I'm going for, you know, uh, crushing, you know, 15 mile bike ride after this podcast. And I did a resistance training workout this morning. It was really hard and my diet's great. And I want to have, you know, I don't know, uh, can't even think of what I would have, but, uh, let's say something sweet for dinner. I like halava, which is sesame seeds and honey and things. 
would I have that after dinner? Yeah, no problem. But I, I don't think it's something that you can consume on a daily, regular basis without having a significant impact on your overall long-term health. So I think that's that's really important to understand. And it, it not only drives all those diseases that I mentioned, but it's implicated in, in, in depression, obviously cancer, and uh, even things like infertility, uh, hormonal dysregulation, impotence in men, uh, you know, hair growth on their face in women and loss of hair on their head. So the, the list goes on and on, but it, it is it is really a significant problem. And so what are you, you're limiting all processed sugars. Are you also limiting fruits and, and natural sugars or how do you view those? So fruits, okay. I think it, again, it depends on your level of metabolic resilience. If you're a type two diabetic, you know, until you become more insulin sensitive, you probably are not going to do well with sugar. And now you can use a continuous glucose monitor and see, because the same input creates very different outputs. You know, if I drink a can of Coca-Cola, my insulin will go up a certain level. If someone is uh, severely insulin resistant, it might go up 10 or a hundred times what mine might go up. So it, it really depends on the person, not necessarily on the food <laughs> and their microbiome, right. their metabolic health and so forth. So it really is, 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 you know, can I eat fruit? Yeah. Do I eat fruit for sure? Is fruit full of a complex set of nutrients and phytochemicals and fiber in, in, in a matrix that's more slowly absorbed than if you're just going to have sugar or, or even fruit juice? Absolutely. So I think it really depends is the answer. And it depends on your state of health and your metabolic health. And continuous glucose monitors are really great because they help you track it. Hopefully soon we'll have what we call an insulin monitor. I, th I think mm. the technology mm -hmm. is not quite there. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be much more, more uh, predictive. For example, I just saw a patient who was overweight, has a big gut, his sugar is perfect. You know, it's fasting sugar is fine, mm. but it's insulin levels through the roof. Mm. <laughs> so when I gave him a glucose tolerance test and did his sugar test, uh, I was like, oh my God, you know, his, his insulin, his sugar didn't go up, but his insulin went through the roof. And that's wow. really what's driving so much of the issue for people. Wow. And does that play into the, the role of exercise? And could you speak a little bit about the exercise piece and why the resistance training in particular to you feels like an important yeah. factor versus some of the other forms of exercise that we might also enjoy? And is it a heart rate thing? Is it a muscle thing? Yeah. Like what's yeah. actually happening? And, and, and also, how does that help uh, kind of brain health and, and mental clarity? Uh, so if you could touch on that. Yeah. That'd be important. yeah, I mean, there's really three pillars of exercise. One is cardiovascular conditioning, strength training and conditioning and flexibility. The, 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 I'm not diminishing the Would balance be in there. Did I miss balance or no? Uh, well, I'd say, you know, flexibility, flexibility and balance. Okay. Think yoga. <laughs> <You Okay. know? laughs> yeah. Everything. Yoga does. Uh, um, I, I think, uh, you know, as when you're younger, your muscle is more driven by the hormonal milieu in your body, your levels of hormones are higher and your, your ability to maintain and sustain muscle is higher. When you get older, it needs to be more nutritionally driven and also more exercise driven. And the thing that causes people to age fast is becoming frail, not being able to do the basic activities of daily living. Imagine if you're like my dad, and we went skiing when he was 75 and he could still ski, wow. but he fell and he, he, he couldn't get up. He couldn't, he couldn't literally get up off the ground. And I, and I had to actually help him get off, which is not easy on a steep ski slope with a big guy at the time. So you want to be able to get up the floor, you know, you know, play with your grandkids. You want to be able to like carry grocery bags in from the house. You want to do the basic things to survive and function. And what happens is, uh, is entropy. As we get older, starting about 30 years old, we start to lose muscle. And you can be the same weight at 20, at 25 and 65, but be twice as fat at 65. In other words, your muscle becomes marble like a ribeye steak rather than a filet mignon. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it's not just that you're losing muscle strength, it's all the other metabolic factors that go into uh, loss of muscle. You get high cortisol, you lower your growth hormone, you have high levels of inflammation, you lower testosterone, you end up having more insulin resistance. And so you end up creating this cascade which is incredibly harmful for our health and for longevity. So keeping and preserving muscle is key. And that there's really a simple formula, which is take a, a 12, maybe 14, 16 hour overnight fast, work out with strength training in the morning, and then do a 40, 30, 40, depending on your size, 50 gram load of protein on a fasted state. So people talk, think about fasting as the key, 
but it actually is when you refeed that you activate all your stem cells and you do all these other things. You build muscle, you activate muscle protein synthesis. And if you start uh, your day with sugar, which is what most people do in this country, whether it's a sweetened coffee or a muffin or a bagel or, you know, worse, French toast, pancakes, cereal, but this goes on, um, you're, you're in a catastrophic metabolic state. Uh, by the time lunch comes around. So having protein, now what kind of protein matters? And that's, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, but resistance training is is key to preserving and building muscle. So you can eat all the food you want, but unless you actually, you know, lift or resist weights of some sort, you're not gonna be able to build the muscle. And yeah. it's like putting uh, ingredients for a soup on a, in a pot and not turning on the stove. You got to turn right. on the stove. And I think that was a, that's kind of been a later area of exploration for you, no? Or am I understanding right? The, the, well, the, no, I kind of knew about it, but I, you know, I, res I was just, you know, I'm a human like everybody else. You did other I, resistance training, resistance training. I resisted training. resistance training. I, I, <laughs> I think I do yoga, you know, I, I, I can do a few push-ups. Actually, I couldn't do 10 push-ups when I was 50 wow. without like just mi being miserably wow. sore the next day. Now I can do, you know, 50, no problem. I can usually get to 75 and sometimes 100 push ups, depending on how much sleep I had. And in one go, not like sets. So, you know, and I'm 63 years old. So the body has an amazing capacity to kind of activate this, these healing systems and be stronger as we get older. And, and I look at pictures of myself when I was 40 and when I'm like 63 and my body looks like it should be the opposite, right? And, I, and it's not because I'm some special specimen, it's just because I understand the science of how to actually turn on muscle protein synthesis and improve my insulin sensitivity and deal with all the things that happen as we as we age yeah. i mean most people my age are already insulin resistant and they're already yeah. you know suffering from multiple chronic diseases and are you know just not in good shape yeah and could you talk a little bit about the brain health piece i know the book goes much more deeply into all of this so encouraging people to definitely check that out but you could, could you tell us a little bit about what we know about what supports uh, better brain functioning yeah, well, I mean, it, again, it's it, it, I, I feel like a broken record, but it's the same, it's <laughs> it's the same, same stuff, right? So sugar is terrible for the brain. Uh, fat is great for the brain. And so, uh, you know, we tend to be fat phobic in this country, but the fat that we eat in our plate is not the fat that goes into our body. That comes from the carbohydrates and sugar. And I think I wrote a book about this years ago called Eat Fat, Get Thin, which is about the science of this. And now ketogenic diets and other things have been proven to reverse diabetes and many other things. So when you look at, when you look at um, the role of the brain in, in longevity, I, I think it's important because you don't want to be, you know, a beautiful physical specimen at 75 years old, but not remember your name, right? So mm -hmm. you, you want to make sure you're, you're taking care of your brain and your brain responds to the same inputs as everything else, the diet exercise, the sleep, stress reduction, and so forth. So uh, exercise actually is a wonderful thing. <coughs> what do you mean? Um, or your brain, it increases something called BDNF. It's like miracle growth for your brain, inclu increases neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. I think, uh, you know, sugar is really harmful for the brain. Fats are really good for the brain. I think we need to be taking care of other things like our microbiome, reducing environmental toxins and uh, eating the, taking the right nutritional supplements, vitamin D, omega-3 fats, and, and many other things that support mitochondrial function. And your brain has more mitochondria than any other organ in your body per cell. Okay. So there's a whole suite of, of things. I wrote a book called The Ultra Mind Solution about 15 years ago, which is about how to take care of your brain. And I, I think it's still a little bit ahead of its time, even though I wrote it a long time ago. Beautiful. And, uh, I want to also talk about, about your advocacy work somewhat, if we can, because yeah. you tried to raise awareness um, on a national, international level about things that we can actually change so that more people are aware of the impact of uh, healthy choices versus unhealthy choices, particularly as it relates to food. And I'm curious, um, what is it that you, what, how can we support you? And, and what is it that you feel like could change on a systemic level? Because it's one yeah. thing for somebody to realize this when they're 40s or 50s, but wouldn't it be amazing if kids in schools actually got the education that they needed to make the choices that could serve them and create a, a healthcare system that's just um, bankrupting us in many ways. And um, yeah, absolutely. I know that that's a deep passion of yours. I'm curious where that, where that work stands and what anyone listening can do to help. Well, thank you for asking. I literally just got off the phone, which is why I was a little late with uh, the staff for the Ways and Means Committee in Congress, which oversees Medicare, which is over a trillion dollar budget and is responsible for a lot of our healthcare decisions. 
and uh we're doing congressional testimony on july 7th i'm sure you'll all be watching on c-span <laughs> it's at nine o'clock in the morning uh and uh the 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 work we're doing is to really advance uh two parallel agendas that are highly interconnected one is food as medicine and two is regenerative agriculture and uh, our work has really pushed forth uh you know some really important initiatives including the white house conference on, on nutrition and create a national strategy around it. We established uh, for the first time ever an entity within uh, Health and Human Services to deal with over 200 policies from 21 different agencies that are mostly at odds with each other and and actually uncoordinated. And an agency, to, you know, a group is in that now is mandated with actually addressing this, looking at all, fixing this problem. We are uh, working on medically tailored meals, working on bringing mental education uh, nutrition education in medical schools, uh, mm. addressing the FDA food labeling, dietary mm. guidelines, uh, food stamps or SNAP, school nutrition, uh, and the list goes on and on, uh, funding research, uh, medically tailored meal bills that's in Congress. So we're working on a lot of levels. It's not a one quick fix solution, just like staying healthy is not a one quick fix solution. But but uh, we're making great progress. We've been doing this since uh, 2020. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done. And I think we have a lot more work to do. But uh, we're, we're making progress. I've, I've built really great alliances. We met with over 100 members of Congress and the Senate and the White House and have great allies now who are understanding this problem. Their level of education was really very low. Uh, mm -hmm. And now it's, it's rising as a result of our work. And I think I, I believe we'll see real progress because we're, we're seeing a, you know increasing awareness that, that this is a problem. Yeah, and the science is increasing to support um, what you've been talking about for 30, 40 years. It, it seems that there's more and more science that backs that, backs that up. And so it's, I'm glad to hear that you're working on that and a deep bow for doing that. Because I think it, it, there's one thing to be like, all right, how do I take care of myself? Which is an important question, right? But then there's this whole other question, which is like, how do we support conditions for so many other people to thrive? And yeah. when you're feeling like shit, it's really hard to thrive. When you're feeling like shit, it's really hard to make good decisions. When you're feeling like shit. And I, I used to work in the inner cities in the Bronx. And I walk around the Bronx and you see the grocery stores and I don't know what the kitchen is like now, but there was like to find an apple or a piece of fruit was really, really difficult. It was alcohol and it was yeah. potato chips and it was just these things that, of course, just around people. And if that's what you know, if that's what you eat in your school. So so thank you so much for doing that. And I, I feel like uh, I appreciate the work that you do, that it's both your own personal world, but you're making that advocacy. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, most of the books I've written have been uh, self-help books. This is the book I wrote called Food Fix was an us help book. Uh, <laughs> that's great. We need, yeah, we need a, and the other thing I want to talk to you about, which I know, um, well, there's kind of a couple things, but what do you, what do you, how do you see kind of spirituality in your spiritual life and, and inner practices? How does that kind of get situated when you're trying to decide like how best you spend your limited time in a day, which we all have limited time and limited resources. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that exploration? Because I think sometimes in the longevity conversations, uh, the the meaning purpose piece sometimes gets a little bit pushed away to the pushed aside, and I also no, it's, think it's sense probably of, the most it, important actually. Yeah, <laughs> um, but could you talk a little bit about uh, how that works in your own life, in your world, in your own exploration? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think it's an important question. I think I think uh, you know I don't know if most people know, but I majored in Buddhism in college. That was my major. So and you were a yoga teacher. And I was a yoga teacher before I was a doctor. So I was a yoga teacher before there were yoga mats or <laughs> Lululemon or spandex. Uh, we basically used sweatpants and t-shirts and towels. Um, and and I think that that uh, it, it's always been core to my own personal life. But when you look at the science uh, around meaning and purpose, if you actually have meaning and purpose in your life, you live seven years longer. If you cured heart disease and cancer from the face of the planet, we'd live seven years longer. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's hugely impactful and on average and, and uh, belonging, which is a key part of our, our, I think, spiritual life. You know, the, the Buddhism talks about the Buddha, which is the, the belief or the, the sort of the representation that awakening is possible. The Dharma, which is the teaching of how to do that and the sangha which is the community that supports you in doing that the community is medicine and and this is a key part of of the work around longevity when you look at the blue zones mm -hmm. uh the the social constructs that that uh, are involved in longevity are really important and uh, having a sense of belonging a meaning and purpose connection love community these are all essential ingredients for health 
Uh, and it actually, it's the way we change, the way our behavior changes. We can, you know, change for good or bad, depending on what we and surround ourselves with all our friends are, you know, watching TV and eating Burger King and drinking sodas, we're probably going to be unhealthy. If all our friends are drinking green juices and doing yoga and jogging five miles a day, we're probably going to be healthy. (laughs) They say you're only as healthy as the five uh, closest friends you have surround yourself with. I mean, I think that's, that's probably true. So I I think that that spirituality, uh, meaning purpose, um, Mm -hmm. connection are all uh, really essential. I do talk a lot about it in the book. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And how about the meditation? I know there's been tons of study on mindfulness in many books written on mindfulness. So uh, that's kind of out in the world. But um, what is your kind of orientation and practice with that? I know you try to meditate. We all probably here try to meditate, uh, even if it's hard some days when it's really busy. But how do you try to find time for that world? Or is, or is your practice more about going into nature? Or is it all of it? You know, it's multifaceted, right? Our spiritual source can be fed in many ways by you know writing by mm-hmm. you know journaling by being in nature by being in deep connection with another by meditation by yoga by breath work by very spiritual practices prayer i mean there, there's no one way to do it uh for me you know how do you be mindful throughout your life you know meditation is not to get better at meditation right it's meditation is to get better at life mm-hmm. <laughs> and so how do you bring that into every encounter every thing you do. And, and that's what I try to do. I also meditate uh, 20 minutes a day, usually try to do twice a day if I if I can get the time. Uh, and that, that really grounds me and helps me and restores me in ways that I think most other things don't. It's, it's kind of like a party trick, honestly, I can be like wiped out after doing like five or six podcasts, sit down for 20 minutes, and like, boom, back to, you know, the tanks filled back up, but it's like three hour nap. So I, I think I think uh, most people, you know, don't don't realize the power of needing to reset and now there's really cool things you can you know do yoga nidra from youtube or spotify yep. you can uh, use devices like apollo or sensate or other things like muse that are assisted devices for entering into a parasympathetic state so there's a lot of ways to do it i think it just depends on what what actually yeah works for you Recently, um, the Surgeon General Vivek Amurthy came out with a, kind of an alarm around the social media, or basically youth, teens' mental health, particularly uh, teenage girls, and the role of social media plays in technology. Uh, we're also coming into a world of AI and just increasing uh, machine learning. Uh, where do you stand with all this? Is, are you concerned? Are you not concerned? Or is there something that we can do to basically understand why the younger generation's mental health is so uh, dire yeah. right now? And yeah, I know I you have a daughter. I have a son. Your daughter's older now, I believe. But but the kids, the kids growing up are sounding a bit of an alarm. And I'm wondering how you interpret that alarm. No, it's, it's a huge concern for me. Um, I actually spent last weekend with someone named Tristan Harris, who was oh yeah, the I lead, one that, yeah. of the lead uh, you know participants in a movie called The Social Dilemma, and you know that described in detail how social media was impacting our mental health. And he also is now focused on AI. There's something called the AI Dilemma, which is a lecture he gave. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, and I encourage people to watch it. It's very disturbing, but it's <laughs> it's very important. And I think, uh, you know, we we kind of got ahead of our skis. It's almost like you know, with with the uh, ultra processed food, we're like, oh, let's make all this great food and snacks, and you know, create you know lots of you know cheap calories for millions of people, and it sounded like a good idea. And now we're all dying because of it. It kills more people than anything else on the planet. So we now have to kind of backtrack and think about how do we regulate and legislate around around these problems. Uh, Europe just banned dope and AI and chat GPT and was like, wow, okay. I think they're, I think they're considering, I don't know if it was banned completely, but I, I, I do think that it's it's under consideration. Uh, we just had the CEO of chat GPT, Sam Altman with us at Wisdom 2.0 a few weeks ago with uh, Jack Cornfield. And um, it's a really fascinating world and there's some really good people involved and there's some uh, there's going to be some um, uses of that that I, I'm very, very concerned by. And I'm glad yeah. it's getting our attention. Yeah. yeah, it's clearly not all bad. I mean, I think as a doctor, I think its application in medical science, which is so complex and difficult, is going to be amazing. But I, but I also think, you know, we need to be smart about how we use it. And I think, you know, I think Dr. Murthy, I know him very well. He's been on my podcast and he wrote a book called Together about the yeah, of increasing yeah. our loneliness epidemic but the loneliness epidemic you know is sort of a paradox of social media is it actually makes you less social 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I think uh, that's part of the problem. So, yeah. So uh, it's that, and and it's so interesting because the way to reach people now is actually on social media, or I guess like Tristan did a documentary, which is another way. But in order to get something to people's attention, you there's these certain avenues to do that. Generally, those avenues, though, there's very sophisticated algorithms whose goal is to try to keep you on that platform as long as possible, right? Like there's there's a, a lot of energy and interest in doing that. And yet we know that what's beneficial to the person is to go for a walk, is to go out in nature, is to kind of connect with a friend. And so I feel like there's this tension about what's good for the human, which is probably maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes, an hour, maybe on, on social media a day. I don't know what the average is. But the companies, based on their economics, that doesn't work so well for them. You know, they make a lot more if you're on it for five or six hours a day. And so, and it seems like that must have some relationship to teen mental health. I think Dr. Murthy is, is surmising that there's a relationship there. And then also when we're not connected to other human beings. And I'm curious, do you see any way of addressing what we what we see is this like real epidemic on our young people, not only unhealthy, but also just they're telling us like one in three girls in 2021 seriously considered committing suicide. And that could be a lot of different purposes and reasons. I don't know, but um, it makes me think about just what they're trying to tell us. Yeah, I mean, it's concerning the third leading cause of death in teenage boys is suicide. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, mental health is a complicated subject yeah. and it's you know there's it has to do with our um really you know our social influences including social media but also our diet and and it's really yeah. clear you know how inflammation the brain is driving many mm -hmm. mental illnesses mm -hmm. there's now departments of nutritional metabolic psychiatry at harvard and stanford there's incredible books written by major major authors mm -hmm. like christopher palmer at harvard yeah. and, and a lot of initiatives showing that you know food and our food system is driving yeah. so much poor health along with the right. other. So you kind yeah. of add those things together and yeah. it's kind of a, a really big problem. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned exosomes. Um, did, I pronounce the name, did I pronounce that right, exosomes? Yeah, exosomes. Um, yeah. What, are, what, are, what are things that you're super curious and excited about that you can kind of tell us about even if they're not ready for prime time yet? Um, yeah. um, but I'm just curious, because you're on the edge, you're on the kind of the leading edge of everything coming through that's potential uh, to support greater health and well-being. And I'm curious, like, what are you ex most excited about? Well, I, I mean, there's so much, and I wrote about a lot of these things in the book. It was a chapter called Advanced Innovations. And so what I would just reiterate is that if, you know, most of us can probably get to 100 years old by doing just the simple things that are basically free, you know, uh, eating healthy food, which doesn't have to cost more than eating junk food or processed food, moving our bodies, getting enough sleep, doing things like meditation, yoga, breath work, dealing with our community, friends, friends don't cost anything. You know, like, and so the, the foundational things are, are so powerful and, and they can get you probably 80, 90% of the way there. And then there's the kind of marginal stuff, which I think is going to be interesting and maybe get us even further to 120 or more. And, and these include things like stem cell therapies or cell therapy, which is everything from exosomes to stem cells, to natural killer cell infusions uh, and techniques like plasmapheresis, which is like getting an oil change in your blood, filtering out all the bad stuff, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Putting, putting back in your cells. Um, treatments like ozone, hyperbaric medicine, which is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which can be expensive. Hypoxia therapy, uh, hormesis therapy. These are all forms of hormesis, which is basically stresses that don't kill you, that make you stronger. Hot and cold therapy. It doesn't even be that fancy. It can be a, simply a hot bath or a you know a cold shower can do a lot of a lot of the benefits of these treatments you don't have to buy a fancy sauna or a cold plunge so these can be really things you add into your daily life um and you know i, I had a steam shower built in my house 25 years ago it's still working i haven't changed it it's the best <laughs> i've ever spent you know i have a big cloth tub uh bathtub a coffee bathtub and i fill it with cold water and yeah. i just soak in there so it's you know there's ways to do it that's not uh cost prohibitive and and i think their their basic things are really great but i think we're we're going to kind of learn more about uh, about these things that i just mentioned then there's stuff coming down the road that's just kind of sci-fi that's like yeah. you know yeah. 3d printing of organs and um uh yamanaka factor insertions that help reprogram your epigenome back to a 25 year old self and 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 things like that seem kind right. of way out there where those are in development you know 
you know, is it a year away, five years, 10 years, 20 years? I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you look at like the ex speed of exponential change. It's just mi mind blowing. You know, we can't really grok yeah. exponential change. You know, if I say, I'm going to give you a dollar a day uh, for 30 days, or I'm going to give you like, you know, I don't know, let's say a hundred bucks, whatever, what would you take? Well, I'll take the hundred bucks, but if you do a, a dollar a day and increase it, you know, by uh, every day, it's like adds up to like $10 million, right? <laughs> it's like exponential change is hard for us to grok. And I think in medicine, we're seeing that with the advent of technology, science and medicine, it's, it's accelerating so fast. I think uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with for most people and for even most physicians. Yeah, beautiful. So we have about 15, 20 minutes left. We have probably time for a few questions. So I know there's probably something happening in chat. You can also raise your hand, which might be a little easier. Um, and uh, yes, most of it is, I'm just looking at chat. Most, there's so much more that's also uh, in his book. But if you want to talk to uh, Dr. Hyman, you have a question, please raise your hand. If you go to reactions, then you can raise your hand. Uh, Nunzia, woo. You're going to ask to unmute, Nunzia. Oh, sorry. I might have done it. And then Scott, who's helping us, might have done it. Okay, wonderful. All right. And where are you calling from? I am in you're, you're in Europe, right? I, sorry? Where are you today? I'm uh, normally in Munich, but this week I'm in Paris. Okay, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Um, I have a quick question, uh, and it's regarding uh, drinking. So um, I like, for example, I drink a lot of herbal tea and uh, I had people telling me that I, I also need to drink a lot of water because herbal tea is draining and is not uh, really um, providing me with all the hydration that the body needs. What's your take on this? I'm just drinking plain water. Is that what you're asking me? That herbal tea is draining is uh, is actually yeah it's draining and it's not hydrating the body enough. I mean, I I don't think so. I mean, I think if you're drinking caffeinated tea like green tea, which yeah, is yeah like tea yeah or and, ginger and green, tea yeah green tea can be a diuretic as any caffeine can. I think that can be dehydrating. I don't think ginger tea would do that. I I think one of the things that's really important people to understand is that not only is hydration important, but intracellular hydration is important, meaning water in your cells. And the only way to get fluid into your cells and have proper intracellular hydration is by using electrolytes. And I think mm -hmm. either through uh, adding just salt to your diet, magnesium-rich foods, potassium-rich foods, or actually taking electrolytes, it's really important. So every morning I wake up in the most dehydrated state, like everybody does, because you can drink all night, and I drink usually a liter of electrolyte water, uh, reverse osmosis water. I just put in uh, liquid electrolytes. I don't have any of the stevia or chemicals or weird stuff. I just, I don't mind drinking salty water. So I just, I just drink that. It's not for everybody, but uh, that, that really is a great way to start your day. And I think that'll get you well hydrated. And I think using electrolytes, if you're doing a lot of activity and things is really important as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. While we're on the issue of drinking, Mark, um, alcohol, uh, stay away completely, have a drink every now and then. <laughs> well, if you look at the blue zones, they tend to drink wine. And uh, the question is, is it the wine or is it all the other things they did right? And I, right. I have to say, I think it's all the other things they did right. <laughs> and and I think the resiliency that comes from that. Um, alcohol, I think it's been I mean, sort of established in pretty much any dose. It, it creates a risk for for disease, whether it's cancer or dementia or mm -hmm. or various other issues. It, you know, I think, do I drink? Yes. I mean, do I have it as a recreational compound once in a while? I might drink, a, you know, I drink every couple of weeks. I might have a drink or two, you know. Um, it's not something I do on a regular basis. I think um, tonight's Friday night. It's Shabbat. I'm friends over. I'm going to open up a bottle of Canana wine from Sardinia that I brought over and back, which has all these higher levels of polyphenols and antioxidants, what they, where they have the longest lived men in the world. So I'm going to tell myself a story that it's okay to have. <laughs> but basically, that, I think, you know, the truth is it's not a health food. It, you shouldn't add it to your diet if you're not drinking as a way to increase longevity or health. In fact, it's probably a, a detractor. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Jill, see you uh, next. Yes, I was just wondering what kind of protein do you suggest for over 50, over 60 years old? I have tendency to have a, maybe as a gene related to have a high cholesterol, so I cannot, I don't really actually like to take too much meat. 
but what kind of protein do we suggest is non-fat yogurt or you know cheese are they okay for you i mean what kind of protein alternative yeah protein? thank you for asking that question i i wish we'd covered it in the main conversation you know um trying to put all ideology aside and all beliefs aside around what we should or shouldn't be eating and what's good for the planet or not i that's a whole nother conversation just on pure biology how how do you activate muscle protein synthesis how do you actually turn the switch to actually build muscle you need to activate mTOR mTOR is important to activate it's also important to silence which is you know what we do when we fast or when we take drugs like rapamycin but if you don't stimulate it at the right time in the right way you won't activate muscle synthesis and the the rate limiting amino acid for activating mTOR is something called leucine leucine is found in in good amounts in animal protein whether it's meat or whey protein it's very low in plant protein so when you see professional like weightlifters who are vegans you know you ask them what they're doing and i've done this they they basically use highly processed pulverized plant proteins with added amino acids mm -hmm. and that that'll get them there but you know if you are a vegan you have to supplement with branched chain amino acids or high leucine uh, substitutes or other compounds you can't you cannot do it without that it's just a law of biology you, you just can't um scientifically advocate for anything else mm -hmm. so i'm not saying you have to eat meat but if you don't you have to make sure you're getting enough of these amino acids whey protein uh, i use regeneratively raised goat whey which i tolerate better it's more more um um likely to you know not cause things like gastrointestinal disturbances or inflammation or acne or a lot of things that traditional dairy does and I use regeneratively raised goat whey protein. So I, for example, had had that this morning after I did my workout. And I find that probably when you look at the data, the most bioavailable, the easy to use, and the most effective for building muscle. But, but, but then how do you do, deal with the cholesterol of the meat? I, dairy? I, I, I would read my book, Eat Fat, Get Then. I, I think that we've been fed a line of junk about cholesterol. Uh, the biggest driver of abnormal cholesterol is sugar and starch, not meat. In fact, stearic acid in meat doesn't really significantly raise cholesterol. Um, certain things like saturated fat in butter can and, and that, that saturated fat in coconut oil can, but it also depends on the quality of the cholesterol and the type of cholesterol. So, you know, depending on your genetics, your body type and so forth, you know, most of the problem we have with cholesterol is not coming from meat. It's not coming from animal fat. It's coming from sugar and starch. Okay, thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Jerome, are you with us? I am here. Good. Do you, you have a question or comment? Yes, I have a question and a comment, actually. Uh, last month, <laughs> I was in Congress advocating for funds for bladder cancer research, and I found the four California offices I visited be, to be very receptive to the information we provided. I'm wondering how people received you in Congress when you were there, and if they're open to discover the health benefits of what you stand for. Oh, absolutely. I mean, both sides of the aisle, uh, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, th there's been a real receptivity. Everybody kind of gets that we're in big doo-doo, uh, that we're sicker. We're getting sicker. We're getting more overweight. Or costs are sc scaling uh, to be untenable, and uh, we need to do something about it. So, I, you know, I think there's a there's a level of lack of awareness of these issues, but I think once they become educated, they're very supportive well, on both again both sides of the aisle. It does seem like there's been a shift. I know, Mark, you you know you've been at this 30, 40 years, and I don't know when the shift exactly happened, but it feels like that the last maybe four or five years. What was alternative is now increasingly mainstream and, and doctors are actually being asked questions that they were never asked before, which is just like, even like, what's the right diet for me? And I'm curious, do you see that same, it, it feels like there's a new momentum emerging. And at the same time, we still have this huge backlog of the way that we have been doing things, the way that we've been feeding our children in schools and places that is slow to change. 
Um, but it feels like the most popular podcasts these days seem to be on health and well-being. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there's a there's a cultural shift, there's a political shift. I mean, I love just I'd like to see it faster. Yeah, I'd like to see it more aggressive. But you know, um, we, we we just have to sort of work on accelerating the pace of change best we can, and that's really why. I slept to Washington. It's not my favorite place to be, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, put on my uh, guerrilla warfare suit and I go okay. down there, you know, <laughs> do what I gotta do. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we might have time for one more. Nicole, let's see. Hi, I just wanted to dig into that protein conversation just a little bit more because of all the stuff you hear about if you're predisposed to heart disease and the link between meat and heart disease and all the replacement, you know, substances that we have and possible burger, beyond meat, all those. And yeah. we could talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, first of all, impossible burger, uh, in, in, in beyond meat, they're, they're highly processed foods and, uh, and and the evidence around their health benefits is is very dubious, and I and I just don't think that's an alternative. I mean, if you want to eat a burger, eat a burger. <laughs> you know, um, if you want to eat beans and grains, eat beans and grains. I think, you know, again, I've written a lot about this in the pig and diet food. What the heck should I eat? Eat fat, get thin. I mean, listen, I want to live to be 120. I don't want to eat meat if if it's going to kill me. So I I spent a lot of time not listening to the headlines or this expert or that expert, but I actually went and looked at all the papers, all the major studies that have been done on meat, both observational studies, clinical trials, smaller trials, animal studies, which don't always translate to humans. For example, if you feed an animal a high fat diet, they do bad. If you feed a human, they do good. So it's it's like, it, it, you really have to kind of look at, you know, all the data as, as a whole. A lot of the, a lot of the data around meat, it came, came from some really large NIH sponsored ARP trials, 500,000 people or more. And when they when they looked at the, the observational data, and what this basically means is they ask food frequency questionnaires. In other words, how much of X or Y food did you eat over X or Y period? So if I asked all of you on this call to tell me what you had last Thursday for lunch, I guarantee you almost no one would be able to tell me, but, <laughs> and be accurate. That that's that's exactly what they're doing with these questionnaires. Now they, they aren't totally bad, but they're but they're kind of not really well validated. And so they basically get some idea in a population what people are eating and whether it's correlated, not causing, but whether it's correlated with um any kind of adverse outcomes. Now, this was done with hormone therapy. The Nurses Health Study found that over 100,000 women nurses who took hormones, they did better in every aspect of their health, heart disease, cancer, dementia, everything. When they actually did a clinical trial and they randomized one group to hormones and another group to no hormones, they found that it was the opposite, complete opposite, that they had to stop the study because women were dying and it was it was unethical to continue the study because they were getting strokes and heart attacks and breast cancer and other things. So you, you got to really look at what is the quality of the data. So a lot of the data showed that meat was a problem was when people thought meat was unhealthy to eat. So the people who ate meat actually were far more unhealthy. These are called confounding variables. So they had, were uh, more of a weight. They ate 800 more calories a day on average. They didn't eat fruits and vegetables. They didn't exercise. They smoked more. They drank more. They didn't take their vitamins. Yes, they had more heart disease and cancer and all this other stuff, but was it the meat or was it all the rest of the stuff? So when you look at actually, you know, direct interventional trials comparing, for example, paleolithic diets with, you know, Mediterranean diets or, you know, or vegetarian diets, they, they overwhelmingly show that they're not harmful. Now, there are certain people when they do eat more saturated fat, and I'm one of them, uh, they're called lean mass hyper responders that tend to actually have a higher bump in their lipids. And that, that's something you have to individualize. But 93.2% of the population is metabolically unhealthy, which means they're somewhere in the spectrum of prediabetes or diabetes. And those people tend to do better on fat and do better on, 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 on animal protein. So I think, I think it really is, is kind of a myth, honestly. I think uh, it's a very prominent myth <laughs> it's promoted by a lot of documentaries and a lot of propaganda but I, I don't think there's a lot of good evidence to support this overwhelming fear about meat and that's that's not to say that we should be eating feedlot meat 100 no 
but you know, I just did a podcast yesterday with a group called The Force of Nature, which is you know aggregating regeneratively raised meat from around the world, whether it's venison, bison, elk, boar, et cetera, beef, and and you know, raised in a humane way that's harvested in a humane way that actually is you know, actually much richer and lots of, of beneficial nutrients. It's obviously doesn't have the hormones, antibiotics, the corn, omega-6 fats that the traditional feedlot meat has. So I think, you know, with that, but even those studies, by the way, were, were on 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 uh, interventional trials, were on feedlot meat. So even that, I think, is probably not as bad as we think. Beautiful, thank yeah. you. Uh, Mark, we just have a few minutes. Is there anything we did not cover that you're like, shit, they didn't even ask me about this. This is like a really important thing. Anything? Oh, uh, I think we did pretty it? good. I, th I think we did pretty, pretty good. I think hormesis we covered. That's a really important yeah. thing. We, somebody asked certain... in the chat just about fasting uh, and the role of fasting. And I know that's something that you're not as emphasis of, but. Well, no, no, I, I think I think I did. I did mention that. I mean, I think taking, taking uh, a break between dinner and breakfast is really important. Okay. Ideally, fourteen to sixteen hours. That's a, we call that you know breakfast, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, if we eat dinner and then we snack all night and then we wake up and eat, that's not good. And yeah. so, giving your body at least twelve to sixteen hours every day with a break from food is key. Mm -hmm. You can do a longer twenty-four hour fast or you know three-day fast every quarter. That's okay, but I don't think you necessarily have to do super prolonged fast to achieve a lot of the benefits. Got it. Beautiful. And if people want to stay in touch with you, uh, is it doc, I think Dr. Hyman, uh, com is the, is kind of the hub of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the doctor's pharmacy podcast is put out every couple of times a week. I have, uh, um, you know, a newsletters that I put out Mark's picks and Mark's kitchen. I have, uh, um, in many of my books, you can find Dr. And then Instagram, social media is Dr. Mark Hyman. You know, it won't be hard to find me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. Well, we're going to let uh, everybody, thank you so much for coming with us. We're going to allow everybody to unmute themselves so you can unmute yourself and you can uh, say some blessings and thank yous in any and all languages. Are thank you, thank Martin. Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was quite interesting. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hyman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank helpful. You. Thank, you. thank you so much. Bye, Barb and Ola. Bye. Thank you, Soren. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. Thank you, Soren. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. Thank you, Thank you, Well, Thank you, Mark. Blessings to you. Yeah. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh